thank you, Daniel, for sharing this conversation today. It's very nice to be able to see you. Although it's although great to see you the too. Online conversation. Yeah, it's uh, not it's not the usual way we're used to seeing each other. Yes, yes. Uh, well, Daniel, as head of exhibitions and loans at the Victoria and Albert Museum London, um, will share with us uh, his experience, his thoughts, and how you are confronted the present now uh, that you're starting to open, uh, not now, but uh, on a new future. We, we are in a different uh, situation. The pandemic came later to South America and we are completely locked down, but it's very important for us to share with you because we will live similar experiences and the way you're going back to normal um, will bring us uh, some lessons, you know, on how we could do it and how we how will we do it because the hope is we will really open and find uh, ourselves together again. So, uh, Daniel, I know you have been in the countryside and um, the countryside is a, more, uh, a place where reflections arises um, coming from the big city, a busy city like London. And uh, have you, how many months have you been in the um, mm -hmm. countryside? Uh, I think I've been here now about something like 95 days. I've been counting because I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our return quite soon. Okay, okay. Um, well, we will go through some topics, and but I, I, I would like to, to know about, I saw in the, in the, in the web, uh, this pandemic object uh, project. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Um, so when, I mean, we launched Pandemic Objects um, both as a blog on our website, um, but also actually as an active collecting campaign. Um, so an acquisitions process, basically, um, really to be able to um, collect and sort of create a narrative around lots of the material culture that was coming out um, or as a result of the lockdown. And, you know, whether those are homemade signs that are um, you know, kind of messages of hope or messages of support for the National Health Service, um, which has obviously played a really prominent role in, in the pandemic here in the UK, um, or just signs where people can communicate to the outside world from outside of their homes. Um, we felt it was really important to start collecting these artifacts um, to really preserve, you know, what was, um, I suppose, uh, to create a portrait of what was happening at this particular moment in, in the UK. That's interesting, yeah, I yes, I, and, and it's also participation from different, uh, from common people also. From everyone, from absolutely everyone. I mean, the I suppose there's there's opportunities for, for people to participate, you know, through the blog posts, but also actually, um, you know, to, to, to offer up um, the material that they've made. And I think we have seen not just in, in you know, in signage, but people have really, in this process of being locked down and in their homes, um, taken really kind of energetically to creativity and to kind of having the time um, to create, basically. And so this is also an opportunity to really, um, you know, make the most of what people have been doing at this period of time. Yes, it's interesting how people are returning back to crafts. And during this period, I was talking yesterday in an interview and a conversation, a dialogue with Tizio Escobar, the uh, Paraguayan uh, theorist, you no? Know? And he, he he told me, he commented to me that that this is because that was on the culture before. It was rising up. How do you see it? These movements, people are baking bread, people yeah. are... Uh, going into water and doing watercolors. How do, uh, it's very interesting for a museum like Victor and Albert to see this kind of movements. How do you uh, see that? I mean, we've, I would say over the past sort of, I don't know, decade or so in the UK, there have been a series of spikes where um, the, the public seem to have taken to sort of more traditional activities like baking, for instance, or, or crafts. And I suppose there was, um, after the financial crisis, 
there was a huge amount of um, like revival from from wartime, um, you know, uh, propaganda about, you know, make do and mend. Um, everything's going to be all right, that sort of thing. And I suppose, you know, with the financial crisis, obviously with the complexity of Brexit um, and now with the pandemic, there are these moments where actually people are finding life in general actually quite um, complicated and, you know, different than the norm. Um, and so people sort of, you know, I, I suppose in some instances they retreat into things which are comforting, um, which are, you know, kind of um, give give something back and a, a sort of an immediate reward from making. Um, and I suppose in, in many of our daily lives, we're not doing things with our hands. We're not creating things. Um, and so this moment during a pandemic, for instance, when we've been in lockdown, well, you have the time to to learn something new, to retreat back to those sorts of skills that you might have done earlier in your life and to start actually, you know, being a bit innovative and creative with your own hands again. Yes, that's very interesting. Also, I think um, museums and cultural centers in art um, has the mission in a way to create awareness about different situations in the world that happen in the world. And how do you feel about uh, other pandemics that uh, not only COVID-19 is a pandemic that's going on, I mean, it's globally, so it has struck us so uh, yeah. bad, but uh, also ma maybe this there is an opportunity to talk uh, more about um, the other pandemics that have been in a way uh, locked down, you know, yeah. they're not uh, talked about, not many exhibitions about other situations. I mean, I think that's one of the that's one aspect of, of the situation that we're all living through right now um, is that unlike many others, it's it's absolutely a universal experience, more or less, that actually every country in the world is in has has in some form been through a period of lockdown um, and, you know, it, it basically unites everyone in something in a way which really there have been very few you know instances in history where the entire planet has been facing a single challenge like this and obviously there are kind of you know there's something like climate change which is a hugely significant challenge that we do all face but obviously um it's not sort of taken collectively with the same seriousness as, as what we've seen with um you know with COVID-19 where countries across the world have locked down their populations and you know someone who is in Sydney or someone in Santiago or in New York or in Moscow is doing the exact same thing and that is um really uh, I suppose um unprecedented but there you know the fact that this is seen as something which um impacts everyone I suppose kind of glazes over in some ways, as you say, other pandemics or other kind of um, health issues, which are really, you know, serious and significant, but which don't, I suppose, gather the same type of momentum and galvanize action. And I can't help but thinking that HIV and AIDS is one of those, you know, at, at this particular moment, you know, there are something like 40 million people um, living with HIV around the world. And obviously there is a huge amount of awareness and there's a huge amount of fundraising and research that goes into that. But if we think back to the early 1980s, how long it took, um, you know, for governments to actually pay any attention to this disease, which was really just targeting and impacting a small portion, um, but, you know, hugely impacting that portion of the population. It's very different to what we're seeing right now. You know, we we saw in a matter of weeks, hundreds of millions and billions of people locked down all over the world in response to this virus. Um, whereas, you know, in response to HIV, actually it took decades for the same amount of funding and kind of energy to get behind actually building awareness for that disease. I completely agree with you. And maybe this is a problem, not, uh, it's, it's a moment, not only to talk about this pandemic, this will go, we will get through this, but to raise the subject about these other health issues. And uh, also museums and cultural centers, we have a responsibility also yeah. regarding environment. This is a crisis um, about environment and, and about the way we are living and about our societies. What you are exposing here about uh, HIV, to, and, and how long it took to, to, to be aware of the need to invest in, in medicine and research. Mm -hmm. That um, talks about a society that really, really has to 
uh, be more empathic with with the others. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the kind of a the real issue is about um, whether something is is seen as you know universal and therefore you know uh, needing attention, or something that actually is seen as you know an issue which only addresses a certain community. And I think you know with with um, you know when when the HIV HIV virus started. Um, you know, to spread to communities in in the early 1980s, really the late 1970s, but early 1980s. Um, those it was it was within communities which were already marginalised, and so to be able to get the support, you know, for those communities at that time, um, and now even was incredibly difficult. And so it wasn't taken on board as sort of an issue, you know, that was for serious consideration for the population as a whole. And it wasn't until that virus started getting out of those particular communities that people started to pay attention. And I think what we have with COVID, obviously, is something which um, is seen as having the potential to affect everyone, and therefore it immediately gets this response. Um, whereas, you know, issues again that you know only impact on marginalised communities yes. don't get the attention that they deserve. And that 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 is something which is not. You know, it's not specific to HIV. It's not specific to coronavirus. It is just kind of through life in general. I completely agree, Daniel. And also, our institutions can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, another reflection that has struck me recently uh, is about the relationship that we establish with the objects and what happens with the technology. We are yeah. saturated of technology. Um, some. Part of the staff the other day was telling me we are so um, so tired of this Zoom and yes. uh, online meeting. Yes, you know? yes, Zoom and fatigue. You are not able to touch. In in South America, we are people who touch and express through the, our bodies, you know, our feelings. We're not able to touch. We are not uh, each other, but we are not able to touch objects. You know, and uh, Victoria and Albert uh, Museum it keeps the heritage of uh, many cultures around the world, um, and this heritage is um, concrete on objects. How do you see the relationship we will establish from these places, from these exhibitions? Uh, how can we establish uh, these relationships in any way or? I mean, there is, you know, in a very black and white sense, um, while we are closed, you know, there are, there are, there's a limited number of ways in which we can try and connect people with material culture and objects. Um, and we've obviously, like many other museums, put a huge amount of, of effort and um, resource into, you know, making, um, making the collections and our exhibitions, um, you know, and our ideas accessible through electronic means, which is really fantastic. And that's something which we do irrespective of when the museum is closed, because obviously our audience is not just the audience that can come to the museum. Every every museum and gallery wants to be able to connect with people a bit further afield. Um, but I, I think in the end, and, and it's as you were starting to say, you know, that we're all feeling a bit of fatigue in terms of having conversations. Um, you know, by a, by a video link and not being able to connect with objects in person. And as, as good and, and as necessary as it is that we continue to keep people, you know, interested and, and sort of feed them with ideas and resources from the museum, in the end, um, there is a desire from, from audiences to really experience uh, the authentic thing. Um, and I think authenticity through this is, is, is seen as, you know, it comes out as more important um, than we had actually understood it to be because we've been separated from these objects for so long. So I think although there is so much that we need to do during this period of closure to continue connecting with our audiences, at the end of the day, what we really want to do is welcome people back. And, you know, that's that's first and foremost to experience the the objects in person and every, anyone who has you know, seen a painting in a book, and all of us saw paintings in books and on slides, you know, when we were going through school, you know, that's one thing. But when you experience it in person, we, you know, the majority of us can can remember that first moment when we encountered a particular piece of art or a particular building in a particular place. And that experience cannot be re cannot be replaced um, 
you know, by the digital. So really the, the authenticity of the objects is paramount. And I think even beyond that, it's, it's understanding that museums are not, they're not just spaces to come and look at things. They are civic spaces and they are social spaces and people need to come back and have that human interaction in them. So, you know, there's this absence that we've got um, being separated from our artworks, but there's also the absence that we all feel really, really hugely, you know, it's been a, a real struggle to be separate from, from people. Yes, a place to meet, a place to share, and a place to have experience. Not only absolutely. To... Yes, yes, it's it's you know you want to have it, you want to experience the objects, but you also want to experience what it is to be there and and the sort of you know the civic engagement that you're offered by being in one of these museums, which at the end of the day, you know they're all founded on the basis of 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 providing you know um, to to the public, and you know when we're closed, we can't do that in the same certainly, way certainly that's what we are missing but we're working on when we will open because we we all know that we will open that's our hope. yes, yes. and i was thinking especially on you and your work on international on the international field uh, maybe for uh, some months or some a couple of years maybe for different um, situations, economical and also environment, um, because of the of the the issues that transport uh, and all that, you know, uh, we will have to rethink maybe on the way that we are working international with collections from VNA or with collections from around the world to VNA. How do you see that? I mean, it obviously at this particular moment is more complicated um, with so many museums shut and, you know, much of the infrastructure that makes these big international collaborations possible, um, you know, much of that infrastructure sort of switched off for operating at a, at a lesser extent. But at the end of the day, you know, what we want to do at the V&A um, and what most other museums want to do is to connect people with ideas um, and those ideas are not just ones which we we conceive ourselves, um, and it's not just artwork that is you know comes from from making in Britain or or a history in Britain or slightly further afield. We want to bring the broadest possible experience and knowledge and ideas to people. And to be able to do that, you've got to be able to work with not just people but the material culture of other places. And so, although this does make it more complicated. Um, the need is actually greater than ever really to continue trying to bring those resources together for audiences here so that what we're not doing is telling quite a uniform story the stories that we want to tell um, we want to be broad and have you know uh, offer a real understanding of 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 um you know international practice really yes, yes. there's an opportunity there because contents and the experience the years of experience your museum have it might be a very good opportunity for us, for other museums and cultural centers around the world to share, you know, this experience and uh, think on how to improve the research because there's more time for research now. I mean, without having those audiences and, and also maybe teaching programs. Have you thought on uh, in, incorporating teaching pro programs for other cultural centers or museums around the world from VNA? Well, we do. We've got um, we do through the the VNA Research Institute. Um, there is a body called the VNA Academy, um, and we run a variety of different courses through that. Um, you know, through the academy, and those are both curatorial courses and and then others which are more practically based. Um, and our, our our desire is always to get you know as broad a possible sort of cohort of of students into those because obviously the broader that cohort of students the richer the conversation and experience and dialogue that we can get going in those in those seminars um so we do quite a lot of that but a lot of our collaboration exists um you know colleague to colleague they're they're sort of professional relationships yeah. with our curators and curators in other places um and and again you know we are although we're closed we're not exactly flush with extra time but I think everyone feels, um, having been in isolation for so many months now, um, that the need for this, you know, working across organizations, 
working across countries is is more necessary than ever. And 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 you know if we take this as an opportunity to close down and look in, that's really to our own detriment. It's actually got to be something which prompts us to stay as open as ever, if not more so. I completely agree with you. I think uh, for the future we will need collaboration, and collaboration is what is, is and will be the way to work with other communities. Yeah, you know? I mean the the you know we 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 can definitely any any organization can think up great ideas on their own, but actually in trying to do things together, the push and pull and the compromise. Um, that you you have to go through in 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 working collaboratively always ends up as a richer you know finished product at the end and so it's really important for us to not you know um, take this as an opportunity to close down and to kind of look in but to continue working with our colleagues across the world. Yes, here yeah, um, talking about the uh, the positive things that this pandemic can can leave us because we have to keep our spirits high and have hope. And um, I think collaboration is one of them. And also because it's so close to us to think of the indigenous communities and the way they live in community. We're uh, really hoping to learn more about this community uh, down here in South America. And um, how do you think uh, in Europe or in London, in VNA, or you, um, do you think uh, there is some awareness of the richness that these uh, uh, different communities around the world that have different practices, different uh, way of living in community? Do you think that uh, somebody's thinking that there might be an inspiration how we can live in a contemporary world, changing? Uh, a little bit or radically, whichever, the neoliberal paradigm. I mean, there's there's definitely an awareness, um, but I wouldn't say that that awareness is is very extensive. Um, and certainly, I mean, I think, you know, if 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 I if I'm candid about our own program at the VNA, you know, there are opportunities within that um, to, you know, to highlight these, you know, practice from different regions that that haven't been, you know, presented in in a major museum in London before. And, and you know, I mean, you've obviously just had uh, a capsule version of the Asia, Asia Pacific Triennial come to you in Santiago last year. And, you know, that that particular region and the practice of that region covering both, um, you know, indigenous art, um, contemporary art, that is both craft-based, film-based, photography, all kinds of material culture. Um, you know, we've not had something like that presented in the UK um, on a scale of what's been done um, both in Santiago or or in Australia. And so there is an awareness of these things, but I think you've got to move on from the awareness and you've got to turn it into actually something that you 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 commit to in a serious way um, through programming, through research. You know, there's got to be some sort of end result that is tangible to that rather than it just being an awareness, because otherwise, um, you know, you, you can't really open it up to more people. And I think that's one of the things that needs to happen is that that awareness needs to grow and one of the ways in which you can grow that awareness is by giving opportunities to people to actually learn what it is um, so you know we we do have work to do and there are you know far before um, the pandemic happened you know we were thinking of lots of really exciting ideas of different um, you know regions of, of practice that we could bring into our program as I know lots of other museums in the UK are doing that's great. That's great. Hope we as uh, South American can share our culture at the VNA and other museums because um, maybe because we're really linked to those cultures, we're part in a way of those cultures. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'm seeing a light there that can, in a way, um, give a solution to rethink our ways of living, you know, and so that's. That's well, and it's got to it's got to be reciprocal as well. It can't be, you know, when we talk about collaboration um, between different regions, it can't be one region pushing ideas out and not being receptive on the way back. It's really got to be an exchange if it's actually going to be collaborative. Otherwise, it's really just export, um, yes. and that that isn't that isn't satisfying for anyone. Completely agree. That's the dialogue, the cultural exactly. dialogue. Yeah. Daniel, I saw the website that uh, Victoria and Albert Museum has a very interesting program for communities. 
uh, emigrants and different communities around uh, the city, I imagine. How are you managing to engage these um, communities through the website? How are you doing it now? So we, we obviously recognize that we exist in, um, happily, an incredibly multicultural city. Um, and that our audience, you know, our audience is 50% um, UK, but 50% overseas. So we have a really diverse audience that comes to the museum, but we also understand that we exist in a very quickly changing museum environment. And for us to continue to be relevant, um, we've got to continue think of thinking up new ways of engaging with different audiences. Um, and, and, you know, we do that through a variety of programs, whether they're our learning programs, um, and those are often related to aspects of the public program and the exhibitions and the displays that we have on, um, or through lecture series. Um, we have a huge program um, for schools, both at the BNA but also outside of the museum across the UK, um, and that really is to build um, sort of you know an understanding of innovation and design within school groups and young people. Um, but really, you know, we, we try to, with all of the programs that we create, um, to target them towards the particular audience that, um, you know, is going to benefit from that. So I suppose it's a case of needing to understand those audiences and what interests them, um, and those being the ways that we bring them into the museum, rather than us setting the ideas of what we want people to enjoy and what we want to be relevant to people. It's actually our responsibility to learn and understand what's relevant and then to program on that basis. Yeah, and I, yeah. I'd say, you know, that goes not just through the programs that we've got, um, but actually, you know, in all the ways in which we we conceive exhibitions and we design exhibitions, you know, the process of co-design where we actually work with our audiences to understand, um, you know, what they want to see and how they want to see it presented and the way in which they want to, you know, have um, ideas talked about. Those are all the kinds of ways in which we try to to work with different audiences. Great, great. Very happy about that. <laughs> well, there's something um, that is that will happen and is happening is fear. How people are fearing each other. We have we are seeing that. How uh, are we going to be able to get the confidence? And when we start going back to these public places like museums and cultural centers, libraries, theaters. Um, how do we lose this fear and we have confidence that these institutions will take care of the health issues and will prepare the buildings and protocols to be able to start visiting these places? Which are the plans you're building during this period? How are you thinking uh, uh, on how will this going back will be? I mean, we're for, for, for many weeks now and for several weeks to come, um, our our main focus has obviously been on the remobilization of, of you know, the teams within the museum working toward um, our reopening. And, you know, we're obviously grateful that we're getting a, a, a significant amount of guidance from government about what the measures are that we have to put in place um, to make our spaces safe. And that's not just safe for um, the visitors but also safe for the staff who you know serve those visitors um so we're i would say we're on the receiving end of, of really useful guidance for that and it is you know our, our responsibility and the responsibility of other museums to make sure that that is implemented as we slowly work towards reopening um now the question of of sort of the fear that people have i mean i think there is um there is fear there but that fear is also balanced with a huge desire to be able to slowly return to some of the things which gave us joy in life. And obviously, you know, museums are for a lot of people, one of those spaces that gives people joy and a sense of satisfaction and, you know, pushes them. And, um, you know, we've got to balance the, the fact that there is fear there and, you know, remedy that with the measures that are put in place, but also go back to our purpose of actually offering audiences this experience. And so, you know, I think if you'd have asked someone three months ago um, how they'd feel about going to a museum, you know, they would have been quite uh, hesitant about it. And I think 
if you ask people today, I think, you know, audiences are slowly getting ready to the idea that there are ways in which we can go about our normal lives in a sensible way, um, while still being able to participate in the things that are so important to us. Um, and for many of us, one of those things is being able to go to the museums and galleries and see works and be with people. Um, so it's just finding that that balance, um, you know, between the pragmatic of, of the situation, but also the desire for people to to move on. Yes, yeah. it will be so important for mental health because many people are being depressed or anxious and and to be able to share to to be able to experience with the works of art. I think it will be very important you know, yeah. to to really start and and hopefully to give the, an importance to culture. Well, I mean, I think this this has very much highlighted how significant and important culture is to so many people. You know, the the complete absence of the ability to to engage, you know, with museums and galleries um, in person has really, I think, for many people, shown what a role that they've played for them. Um, and so, you know, obviously, our desire is that as we do slowly return to opening up museums and galleries again. Um, that our audiences will slowly return to us as well because we we do we know that desire is there yes this is a struggle uh, we are here in chile at least to create awareness about the importance of culture it's very difficult because when you have uh, people with hunger you know with really uh, is uh, issues on uh, social issues it's very difficult you know to keep the balance and but really, really, uh, I think that can make the difference for us as a country. Uh, uh, it, it can make the difference for the people. You mm -hmm. only, you not only need food. You really need to to feed your spirit, your soul. Well, and I, I think it's really important that you know all cultural organisations and all of those working in the cultural sector, um, you know, champion the 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 position that arts and culture are it's a democratic thing they're not just for one part of the population that actually this these the the cultural sector serves a purpose for absolutely everyone it's beholden to us to make sure that we provide that access and we do everything we can to expand you know uh its relevance but it isn't just for one part of the population by any means yes i completely yeah. agree i completely agree and this can make the difference for mm -hmm. the people this yes, and it, it's as you say, it's about it's about a balance. It's not it's not either or. It's not um, you know funding one thing and not another. It's about being you know pragmatic about what it's possible to do, um, but not undervaluing culture. Yes, we're hoping that maybe what this pandemic uh, leaves us is a better value for culture. We are really hoping for that. We are hoping also that uh, this pandemic leaves us the awareness of collaboration and the, really the importance of collaborating. And uh, that's why I wanted to talk with you, Daniel, because I think it's important to share and to have this collaboration around the world. Uh, it's very important. You're ahead in the, in, in the chronogram, as we say here, that happened before in Europe. So we are experiencing later the pandemic and I think it's very important to keep contact and to keep on working, to share contents, to share points of view. So I'm very grateful for this conversation. Well, it's my pleasure, yes. Lots of reflection, Daniel. Um, one of this is how can we live together? How is living together in this contemporary world after the pandemic? I mean, from from personal experience, having been, you know, having spent the last three months outside of London, which is my normal home, um, I feel like in many ways this has actually showed people how much they do want to be together, how much they do want to be a part of a community, how much they actually thrive and need um, that interaction with other people, because we've all been living you know, in, in quite strict isolation for so many months now. And one of the, the greatest struggles of that and the, the biggest difficulties is that um, you, you know, you're experiencing that absence of interaction with other with other people. And that actually, for the majority of us, is something which actually energizes us and keeps us going. And so 
you know, I really think that this has shown us um, the importance, actually, of our ability to to be together, to come together. Um, and that can be to come together in a very basic way, you know, with, with people, you know, over a table, um, you know, or it can actually be about the communities that we actually form a bigger part of. Um, and, you know, and that actually make up what are our lives. Um, so it's obviously been very difficult, um, but I can't see people retracting from the idea of, of, of you know, community um, after the pandemic. I see people actually really wanting to, you know, strengthen their communities, strengthen bonds to communities, to people, to each other, because this has shown us actually how much we all rely on that. That's great because uh, we are experiencing the need of each other, and that's one hundred percent. Yes, and that's great. And that's great to think that from our spaces, from our institutions, we can collaborate and, ma and maybe make an emphasis on that. That our institutions are to bring people together, mm -hmm. to 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 create community. That's our mission. It's, that's community. true. And you know, the the the, the thinking we are trying to have about. Um, you know, as we return to the museum and there's obviously been, you know, a great deal of talk about social distancing, um, you know, to to stop the spread of the virus. But we are also thinking about this in terms of physical distancing, because we don't want people to be socially distant. We want people to be physically apart. But actually, you know, the museums have a social role as well. And we don't want that to disappear. Yes, that's great. So we will find each other. Uh, with the community and we will work really to bring everybody together and to find new ways of being together. Is it physically, not physically, we will be together and that's our main task to be exactly. together. Yes. Thank you very much, Daniel. It was a pleasure to talk with you, to share some insights. Always a pleasure. Yes, and we will meet again. And we will meet again. Really, thank you and keep us telling how things are going in London on the, at Victoria and Albert Museum and we will keep telling you how things are going down here in Chile. Of course. Well, we're sending all best wishes from London. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.